I grew up in a small town with a population of about 9,000 people. It was a nice, sleepy place with nothing really remarkable about it. Well, some people would point to the local gourd growing contest and disagree with me, but I never thought there was anything special about where I lived. That was until I turned 13. But I think I had my suspicions far before then. It was when I was seven and watching something on television. I must have seen this show a million times before, but it was only then that it hit me that there was something off about every house I'd ever seen on television. Namely, there was a door in front. Of course, now I realize that's such a perfectly normal thing, but not then. None of the residential houses in my own town had a front door or a back door or any kind of door leading outside for that matter. You're probably wondering how it was we got in and out. And the answer was varied. Some people would just climb through a window built for that purpose. A lot of houses had a fire escape, the kind you might see in places like New York City, which could be lowered down so that people could climb up. The inside of our houses was normal, though. Doorways and doors inside, no problem. Just no doors were there leading right outside the house. If anyone came to visit, they'd knock on a window or ring a bell outside. Usually, we would leave a sign outside leading up to the front of the house telling people that they should announce themselves. Packages would usually be left below windows in case no one was home. The pizza delivery guy would tap on your window and we'd open it to take the pizza and hand over the cash. This all must seem very silly to you, but I'd grown up like this and had never questioned it. Not to say this was true for all buildings in our town. Public buildings like the school and such did have doors, but not the houses where people lived. In addition, there was a rather strict curfew where everyone would go home by sunset. Again, I never really questioned the curfew, given that was just how I was raised. But that was until I turned 13. Just like many teenagers, I began questioning many of the rules imposed upon me. However, I still stuck to the curfew given how strict our town was about it. That was, except for one night. A night I won't forget for as long as I live. It all started with my friend Dan. While I remember the events of that night vividly, what led up to that night is kind of hazy. I think that Dan lost a bet, and as part of that he had to stay in school on Halloween night past curfew. Either that, or it was a dare. Regardless of how it started, Dan and I had been thick as thieves, so I knew that I couldn't let him go into this alone. Now, while curfew was enforced in my town rather strictly, it was generally okay if you were out an hour or so late. Not so for Halloween. On that night, everyone, even the adults, were back home far before it came dark. As a matter of fact, we even did our trick-or-treating one day before, on the 30th, and that too, while the sun was up. My house didn't have a fire escape, so my choice of an exit was a window on the ground floor. When my parents were busy with something in the kitchen, I gently slid it open and hopped out. It honestly surprised me just how easy it was to sneak out. Then again, now that I think about it, I feel guilty because it probably meant that my parents just implicitly trusted me that much. I landed on the ground lightly and slid the window so it was open just a crack for my return. I should have realized as I wandered the street and saw no one, and this was a bad idea. But when I saw Dan, my resolve strengthened, and we made our way to our school. You have the camera? I asked him. Yeah, he said with a grin. I had always thought there would be police cars or the like patrolling the streets during the curfew to enforce it, but no. <laughs> streets were totally empty. This should have been a clear message to us that 
We should have turned around, but we were two boneheaded teenagers and thought nothing of it. The school itself had a strange, haunting feel to it. It was not helped by the fact that this was Halloween night and the decorations everywhere leered at us. I knew there was no way that I'd have the courage to come here by myself if I ever asked to. Man, who would have thought the day'd come when you sneak out of your house to go to school? I asked. Dan chuckled. He was rather famous for ditching school, but I was usually too chicken to join him. I was also kind of a bookworm and a teacher's pet and didn't want to miss out on school. Dan could usually drag me into almost anything, but that was one of the exceptions. That was part of why I wanted to be with Dan this night. I wanted to do something really crazy during my adolescent years. Come here, Dan said. Front door's locked, but I left the window open. The two of us were used to jumping into buildings through windows, and we found ourselves inside of an old classroom we had been in two grades prior. I was about to ask why he chose this one in particular, but then remembered that our new one was on the second floor. So, what now? I asked, as the two of us were inside. Dan turned on the camera to introduce himself. Yo guys, it's me, your boy Dan, and we're here at school on a Halloween night, he said. His style was rather similar to old school YouTubers. You can maybe even imagine him adding in that you should like and subscribe at the end. So yeah, we're here, and just to prove that this was on Halloween, I'm leaving this here. He pulled out a pine cone, which he had painted blue. I'm going to put this on our desk to prove we were here. If anyone in the morning saw that, they would just think it was some weird art project someone left. But anyone who saw that tape would know otherwise. Come on, Dan said, motioning me to follow him upstairs. Now that I look back on the whole thing, it was odd that the door of the classroom wasn't locked and that we could wander around the place so easily. But thinking about it some more, it was obvious why they wouldn't bother locking it up. Because no one was stupid enough to break in. We went up the stairs and every single squeak and creak sent me nearly jumping out of my shoes. Dan shook his head as he saw me. He had nerves of steel. At least he did for now. The two of us walked into our classroom and set the pine cone on the table. Dan took out the camera to start talking to it again when I heard something very loud. Dan stopped as I peeked out of a window. I saw some shadowy figures nearing the school. Dan, we're, we're being found out. Dan took a quick look as well and motioned for us to hide. I didn't notice it since I only got a quick glance outside, but the figures had very odd proportions. In other words, they were not human at all. But at the time, I just assumed that our parents had come for us. Dan turned off his flashlight and also his camera. I turned off mine as well. After some whispering, we both decided to try and use the other set of stairs to get to a room at the back of the school. If push came to shove, we could get outside through a window and sneak out behind the school. It was a bit harder maneuvering, given that we weren't using flashlights, but as we heard the sound of footsteps, we quickened our paces. Here, Dan said while opening the door. Both of us ducked into a classroom, and I began wiggling a window free so we could get out. Come on, Dan, let's go, I told him. We had pretty much done enough risky things that night to become living legends among the class as far as I knew, so even if we hadn't technically spent the whole night at school, it was still cool. No one would look down on us. However, Dan seemed to be frozen in place for some reason. I tried shaking him, and he just pointed out the other window into the hallway. I couldn't see his expression in the darkness, and all he did to acknowledge my prodding was to raise his flashlight and turn it on. 
One of those things was standing right outside the window. There's no other way for me to describe it other than a thing. It had to be about seven feet tall. It had a lower body which was mechanical, its upper portion wearing some sort of military coat, and its head was smashed in and deformed. It only had one discernible eye, which was focused on us. Dan screamed, his nerves of steel broken, and I grabbed his hand and had to almost practically drag him out of the window. The two of us didn't look back as we raced back to our houses and half the time it had taken us to get there. Needless to say, my parents were both very worried and very pissed. I was punished extremely severely for what I'd done. But when I told them the story about what I'd said, both of them had horrified looks on their faces. The two of them whispered to each other, and my dad told me a story. Normally, I'd tell you this when you turned 18, but now that you've seen one of them, what are they? I blurted out. Calm down. We don't know, my dad explained. At some point during the Cold War, our town was a testing ground for the military. They were trying to make a new kind of soldier, and it went wrong somehow, and they just left. But then those things began wandering the streets at night and would burst into people's houses, knocking the door down no matter what it was made of or how many locks you put on it. They could sense life, and we couldn't hide from them in any reliable way. One or two people were injured, and many just disappeared after encountering them. We thought about abandoning the town, but, well, we found a way to deal with them. Whatever programming they had, had a severe flaw. They couldn't find their way into places that didn't have a door. Seems like they wouldn't identify it as a house. And so, that's why we make our houses like this. Why on Halloween, though? My dad shrugged. Some people say they were made using malevolent spirits, infusing them with technology at the time somehow, which is why they became more active on Halloween, but no one knows for sure. Maybe that's the reason they can't get in if there's no door. Perhaps the spirits or entity they're based on can only get in through a doorway. Anyway, they may or may not turn up on any given night, but they're always active on Halloween. You two are lucky to have escaped. After the explanation, there was a lot of yelling. Long story short, I was grounded for most of my teenage years. But with all that said, our town isn't a bad place. It's really nice. Just in case you happen to visit, make sure to not stay around past night. Especially if it's Halloween. When I first saw the old woman... I thought it was a Halloween costume. It was only the 30th, and we were in a grocery store parking lot, but I had already started to see people dressed up for parties, festivals, and just because. And she looked so... odd. Her feet and legs were what I noticed first, of course. Barefoot and spindle-legged. She was wrapped from sole to upper shin in what I assumed was thick medical gauze. It was as though she'd started wrapping herself to look like a mummy and then either ran out of material or energy. But then I saw how she was bent over, her thin gray eyebrows furrowed and a crooked cigarette dangling from her lips as she studied the ground around the back of her car. She wasn't playing dress up. And clearly she was looking for something, whether real or imagined. I hated the thing. It was judgmental. Just because she looked to be in her 80s didn't mean she was senile. Maybe she dropped her keys or her phone. 
Feeling a pang of guilt, I changed route from heading into the store and approached her with a smiling wave. Can I help you, ma'am? Did you lose something? The woman looked up and I froze in my tracks. Seeing her up close, she still looked old, but everything was off somehow. She moved quicker than I would have thought possible, given her appearance, and while her face was very wrinkled, the creases and lines almost looked more like a short lifetime of hard use than someone who had simply gotten old. But it was her eyes, bright and sharp and strangely familiar, and it slowed me to a stop. She just stared at me for a moment before letting out a coarse bark of a laugh and scratching at the bandage on her left shin. Shaking her head slightly, she muttered to herself as she ignored my question and went back to looking. I almost left it at that, but something about this woman made me uncomfortable. Unsettled. And I felt a compulsion to get some kind of normal interaction out of her before I left her alone. You sure? I don't mind helping you look. The woman glanced back up. This time, her expression was free of any bitter humor. Instead, she looked unfathomably sad. After staring at me for a moment, she nodded. I appreciate it, but I don't think there's any point. She pointed to a nearby bench on the side of the store. But if you're cool with it, I wouldn't mind company while I rest for a minute. I felt a stab of regret for asking again. I was on my lunch break and had planned on running into the store for a minute, but I had stuck my nose in and I didn't want to be rude. The woman had already started shuffling off toward the old wooden bench and reluctantly, I followed. We sat down and I was about to make an attempt at an awkward chit-chat when the woman began speaking again, her voice softer than before. You're wondering about the bandages, aren't you? I felt my face begin to burn as I shook my head. I... No, I, I, I mean... Another short laugh. <laughs> Don't lie. It's what I'd be wondering. So it stands to reason. And they are odd enough, I know, but it's the only thing that seems to help when they're gone. It hurts and itches regardless, but I can't stand pants or shoes when it's like this. I didn't know how to respond. And I didn't want to pry, but she seemed to want to talk about her strange condition. Taking a breath and knowing I might just be prolonging my lateness returning to work... I asked the question. So, what happened to you? Um, if you don't mind me asking. The woman caught my eyes again. And again, I had that disorienting sensation of familiarity. And I knew her from somewhere. She held my gaze for several seconds before nodding slightly and turning to stare off into the corner of the parking lot. And then, she began to tell me. One day I was out hiking south of town. I know what you're thinking, but I was much more able-bodied then, I assure you. I'd been in the woods most of the morning and at some point I got off course. I wasn't lost, not exactly, but when I came out of the trees I was in a field I didn't recognize, but I had a good sense that I needed to head north and that north was across the field, so that's the way I headed. It was a large plot of overgrown, hilly farmland, and while I could see a fence in the distance, there was little other sign that anyone had been tending to the area for some time. I walked for several minutes before cresting a hill and stopping as I saw what lay in the bowl-shaped depression ahead. It was basically a large mud pit, the lush, tall grass that covered the rest of the field first turned yellow and stunted before becoming the brown-black sludge that filled the bottom. That was slightly odd in its own right, but it was what lay in the muck that caught my eye. 
There were five balls. Well, I call them balls, but they were more some kind of sphere, I guess. They ranged from the size of a kickball to one probably taller than us, and they were all different colors, from a bright speckled green at the smallest to the dark red one, the biggest, in the middle of the rest. I couldn't say for sure what any of them were actually made of. I could see shapes underneath their smooth, cloudy surfaces, but I had no intention of getting a closer look. Then I noticed the small green one was starting to move. For a second, I thought it was just my imagination, but as I watched, the top of the ball flexed up and down once, twice, and it began to split open. I didn't see any more because I turned and ran. I didn't care where I was going anymore, just that it was away from whatever those things were. It was then I heard the sound, a pulsing, high, low, high noise coming up from behind me fast. I had time to think of crickets and discard the thought before I felt the first of them landing on my legs and starting to bite. My fear started turning into a blind panic, and I don't remember much after that. I know I tried to keep running and then I fell down. They'd all caught up to me by then, covering my legs and working their way down into my shoes. Not just biting, but clawing their way inside my skin as they went. I finally made it back to town and went to the hospital. Said I'd been attacked by some kind of barrowing insect and they needed to help me. My skin had gone back to normal, but... Well, I could still feel them in there, you see. Shifting and clawing beneath the surface of my meat. I had to get them out. But the doctors saw nothing. X-rays, MRIs, and as I insisted on more and more tests, they started turning their question toward things like, did I have a drug problem or a family history of mental illness? After a week of being poked and prodded, I gave up. The itching had stopped, and I was starting to agree with them that the only thing wrong was in my head. It was two weeks later when they came crawling out of my legs and feet again. I figured out over time that you can't predict them exactly, but usually every two or three months they need to come out and feed. I think they must be feeding on me at least a little the rest of the time because within an hour or two of them hatching from my skin and flying off, I look like this. I know I look ancient, but I'm not. I'm only 29 years old. Most of the time I look at even if my looks aren't quite what they once were, but when they leave for a time, I dry up, get weak, old looking. I never die. They don't ever let me die, even if I... Well, I can't die. I'll say that much. But it's like I'm just a dried-up husk until they return and are full and satisfied. They barrow back in, and within minutes I feel strong again, young, and there's no sign of them having ever been there at all. Of course, I'm the only one that can see them anyway them, or the wounds they cause when they come and go. I think that's part of how they're so effective. They fly off and... Well, I think they hurt people somehow. I think that's what feeds them, though I've never seen it myself. They take their meals away from me, whatever they are. You would think that after all this time, I'd be more used to it, even as horrible as it is. People can get used to just about anything, right? But I think part of that is because people can change. You adapt to the bad shit that comes and try to make things better in the future. And for me, I can't do that. Not really. Because every so often when they come back, it's not just me that changes. It's everything something that they've done to me. I'm unseated, you understand? No, I can see you don't. 
It's like... Like one time, I had a pair of jeans with rhinestones in the back pocket, and one day in the washing machine, the rhinestones started coming out. They were tumbling round and loose in all that water and agitation. That's how I am. I'm not in my normal place in time anymore. I move along for a while, and then one time, seemingly at random, their return moves me to someplace else. Some other time, forward, backward, it doesn't matter. It's always just a few years, and it never lasts. I don't know. I know this sounds crazy, and it is. But it's also the truth. I don't know if they do it intentionally, or if it's just a side effect. And I've tried changing the past before... And something always stops it from sticking. That's why, even as I tell you all this, I don't think it'll make any... She broke off as a thrum began to fill the air. Small specks, a miniature swarm of tightly clustered creatures that looked like mosquitoes from a distance, but more like winged ants as the closer they got, were fast approaching us. I saw the cloud past several people in the parking lot, and not one of them glanced its way or seemed to hear the creatures droning as they flew by. I looked over to the woman, desperate for some kind of help in my confusion and fear, but she was already busy unwrapping her legs and feet, preparing them for the swarm's arrival. Her newly exposed skin was riddled with deep holes. They weren't bleeding or scabbed at all, and around the edge of each hole, the skin was so black it almost looked burned. I wanted to run to offer her help, to tell her that this couldn't be happening, and, and they were there, flying all around us briefly before diving into her skin, crawling into the holes. The moments, the holes began to close, and as I watched, her skin appeared to become whole. More than that, it became smooth and tight as her legs seemed to swell with new muscle and vitality. That's when I looked up at her face, and I saw myself looking back. What year is it? What's the date? I could barely breathe, much less talk. My head was swimming. I must be dreaming or sick. There's no way that any... Tell me, hurry. I feel it coming on me now. I wanted to look away to deny everything but her eyes. My eyes penned me in place even as her desperate pleading tone pulled a few words from my throat. It's, uh... October 30th. 2017. Uh, October 30th. The other woman nodded, giving me a sympathetic look. She reached out and gripped my arm. This doesn't happen for over two years. I don't know that you can avoid it, even if you try, but please do try. Run away. Move to another continent. Do something, anything to avoid what I've... what we've become. And remember... Just like that, she was gone. I actually looked around, thinking I must have blacked out momentarily or something else that would explain her sudden disappearance, but there was no sign that that had happened. I saw the same old man putting away his shopping cart who'd been loading his groceries as the swarm had passed invisibly by. When I stood up, I was shaking so badly I could barely walk. I went home instead of going back to work, and I spent the next two days going over what I'd seen and been told by the impossible other version of myself. And then I started packing. That was two years ago, and I've spent most of the time since working at a pub on the coast of Wales. My life's been good overall. I have friends and a dog, and most days I manage to have at least a few hours where I don't think about that conversation on the bench. That's improved even more recently, because I'm starting to forget. It's happening quickly. 
Over the last few weeks, I've started having periods where I can't remember the details of what happened that day in the parking lot. Times when I wonder why I'm still here instead of going back to my hometown of Empire. When it comes back to me, when I remember what I'm starting to forget, it terrifies me. I try to hold on to it, but I can feel it slipping away. Writing this as a record and a reminder, but how long before I forget too? How long before the terrible thing that is waiting calls me home? I was doing laundry as I wrote this. And this pair of jeans I bought last weekend in Cardiff had already started to show wear. They had this little rhinestone pattern on the back pocket that I thought was cute, but some of the stones are missing now. Lost in the washer somewhere, I guess. For some reason, that makes me sadder than I think it should. I'm wondering if it has something to do with what I wrote above, and I've tried to check, but... I can't remember what I read as soon as I'm done. I, I know that's strange, and I don't understand it. Even word to word now, I feel like I'm writing some kind of stream of consciousness thing like we had to do in college. I don't remember what the point of all this was now, and I don't like thinking about it because it scares me. Either way, I need to stop here. This little journal, or whatever it is, will just have to wait. I have a million things to do, and... Oh, God, I hate packing. My chair tilts back as I scroll through the horror forum post. There's not one thing that I've read or watched that has so much as quickened my heart rate. I dejectedly set my phone aside, knowing there's nothing I'll find here. Horror's not like it used to be. Conceptual horror seemed to shift from when I was younger. We went from ominous monsters and creepy basements to the attack of one's own mind. When something decent comes out, it becomes so rapidly oversaturated that it's ruined. The whole world's desensitized. The imaginations don't believe like they did in the old horror era. It's all real life events, psychological scares. Some victims' worst day of their life told aloud for listeners and readers to sit in the dark eating their popcorn too, eyes alight with excitement. You want real horror stories, just turn on the news. There's horror, misfortune, and tragedy everywhere. Killing time, I go online and look for people that have the same problem. Fearing I'm deadened inside, I need to find something, anything that rattles me. I need to know I'm not the only one. This wasn't what I was looking for, but I came across a term called lucid dreaming. It's basically how to take control over a situation in your dreams, how to recognize you're in a dream, how to best react, etc. There are exercises that are supposed to help the interior prefrontal cortex of the brain so you can achieve this. I decide to try it out. My mind fights to clear itself as I try to sleep. The pull of sleep begins to win its fight against the failures and successes of the day as I peacefully drift away. I wake up in my bed, in my room, but it's not in my room. Everything basically looks the same, just a tinge different. Like a life where red means go and green means stop. Not to that extreme opposite, but still as different. My floor is bare and cement, almost like a basement would be. A silhouette is crouched in the corner, illuminated by the moonlight's glowing kiss. Upon being noticed, it rises and starts to approach me. It retreats from the shadows and reveals itself in its full form to me. It's not human, or he, or she. Standing before me is a large, flesh-colored mass. 
There are eyes of every color and shape. Some are crying sadly while others glare with bright, hot hatred. They all look so familiar, but I know this can't be. There are holes throughout its face. Yeah, face. Upon closer inspection, I see that they aren't holes. They're mouths. Tiny mouths that go with the many tiny eyes to make up the little terrible faces. It grows taller and taller the closer it gets to my bed. I'm too distracted by the familiarity of this thing to truly show any emotion. Those faces, I recognize one of them now. It's my grandma Hilly. Another is my first true love, the teacher that I loved the most. One face I thought I'd never have to see again. Another was my childhood bully. They went on like that. Some were faces that caused me fear. Others were ones that brought me happiness, but now held expressions disgustingly heartbroken and hateful. It pains me to look at. I refuse to look. I know I don't care what it wants. My feet fly out of my bed and I run past the creature. His breath hits my back with an overwhelming scent of fish and garbage. I'm taking back control of my mind, my dreams. Okay, so now I'm in the hallway. What next? It's at this point where I become instantly paralyzed inside of my body. No, I don't mean that I slumped to the floor or lost control of all functions. I mean my body's moving. My feet are walking, but I'm not making it happen. I approach a big black door, and my feet take me through it. The first room is completely empty. It's wall and navy blue. I see nothing but can hear voices. So many voices. All of them, ones that I know. I want to rupture my eardrums, scream to drown them out, anything. I heard the voices of all the boyfriends that have ever broken my heart. Every hateful thing anyone had ever said behind my back or thought about me during a conversation. My Grandma Hilly is asking where Grandpa Harold is, sobbing with heartbreak between each word. He's supposed to be here. Where is my Harold? He promised he'd wait for me. I don't want to be alone. I'm so cold. I can't see. Where is anyone? Her words and sobs break me to the core of my very heart. The volume of my voice tests its limits, trying to scream to her. Don't cry. You're not alone, Nona. I'm here. The wall is freezing as my back slumps down it to the floor. And then I hear my mother and father's voices. My father wasn't the man I shared DNA with, and he hated me for it. I inherited my mother's lover's eyes, and he wanted to hit me every time he looked into them. My mother hated me for being the permanent bruise on her perfect apple of a marriage. Of a life. My teachers who encouraged me all said I wouldn't amount to zip. The boy who took my virginity and was walking around talking about how terrible it was. He says he lied about it being his first time and I was by far the worst. I re into the hallway, happy to be out of the room but terrified of what awaits. The next room is the family room. I let visions take over and weep until my sides are sore. I see myself happy and pregnant. It's a baby boy. He grows before my eyes into the sweetest looking toddler. And then I see his deaths. I have to watch him die over and over again in horror. The worst being a scenario being on Halloween. The man that I came to recognize as my have yet to be met husband was dressed as a viking berserker, fake long sword and everything. Our son is admiring him and squealing with pride. We're all smiling and about to head out to gather candy. My husband steps in front of us and blocks the front door. 
he draws his sword with a smile. He then impales the boy's chest with it, pinning his body to the door. I can see the man I love cry out in triumph, gurgling from our son's blood in his roaring throat. There are many different ages and circumstances leading up to his death, but it was always the same boy. My son, a beautiful, pure, and innocent soul that I created and brought into this world just for him to get torn down like a kite in a lightning storm. My heart breaks so much for this little being who before that night never even existed to me. It feels like a hand crushes my heart every time I see him sad, angry, hurt, dead. I can't watch but my eyes won't let me look away. Another room brings me to a different man. One that my heart already knows well. My fiancé, Eric, is naked on a huge single mattress, dirty and stained. He's on his knees and in front of him is an equally naked woman. She's wearing a masquerade ball mask and her skin is streaked with blood. It's fresh in some spots, dried in others. Eric has blood on his body too. They're going at it like a couple of feral animals. With his thrust come insults about me and they laugh at everything I've ever been as a person, everything that makes up my heart. They flip and rearrange, biting and slapping at each other until they don't even look like people anymore. A sob escapes my lips. Her head whips around toward me suddenly and she has the face of a sheep. What the hell is this? And then there's what I can only call the Divitational Room. It's filled with religious pictures that have been perverted and darkened with time. There's every theological figure in existence, not just God. I saw Buddha, Isis, Shiva, Jesus, Lilith, and several more that I didn't even recognize. In the middle of the wall was a single red cabinet. The cabinet door had a sign on it that read, Open for a taste of the afterlife. Okay, now, this is just getting stupid. With rolling eyes and a slight disdain, I opened the door and looked inside. I see he leaves me breathless. I can almost feel my soul deflating like a dark balloon, the air of all my past beliefs hissing out by one. It was nothing, just complete blackness. I hear the creature's voice boom throughout the room. Ashley, heaven is just the North Pole for adults, you see. All those poor souls who live hard, unfair lives are greeted with nothing. The children, taken too soon, aren't carried off into an infinite toy land up above. Your Grandpa Harold wasn't waiting for Grandma Hilly when she died. What you heard were her dying thoughts, her last brain impulses. There was no one, no judgment. There is no reward for the righteous. The meek don't inherit the earth. You live, and then you die, and nothing in between means a damn thing. The sound of its laughter bounces off the walls around me. When I close the cabinet door, I hear a click inside the wall. A blaring alarm goes off, and red liquid starts dripping down the surrounding walls in such a way that perfect X's form over each picture. As soon as I can breathe again, I run out, slamming the door behind me. The sound of it echoes through the chamber like a mournful cry. The door behind me to my left opens. I turn around with dreadful trepidation. My feet guide me toward it in mental betrayal, the connection between my brain and my feet severed. The light from within the room shines into the hallway. Flecks of dust dance through the air in front of our doorway. My mind takes me right back to my childhood. 
I can remember dancing in the sunshine dust as it floated through the diamond shape of our door window, my mind barely succeeding in distracting me when I remembered where I was. The room has brown carpet and bright yellow walls. My eyes widen at the cheeriness of the atmosphere. I don't understand, but I can't say I'm not pleased. There are animals here. Cats, dogs. The relief of muscle control slowly returns to my face. Maybe lucid dream therapy is finally working. A wide smile spreads across my lips. These, all at one time or another, were pets that had belonged to my family when I was a kid. There's Paka, our white husky mix that we had when I was nine. He died after getting hit by a car, but here he is, healthy and happy. His tongue sticks out like it always had when he was alive. I see my German Shepherd Cubby, who had died of old age, agile and running around like a puppy. My heart leaps as I see a black and white fluffy figure staunter toward me. She was my favorite pet, my cat, Dilly. I had her for most of my teenage years. She had an attitude just like mine, and only I was allowed to interact with her. As soon as my knee hits the ground, she affectionately rubs against it, and my hands run through her fur lovingly as I take her into my arms. It's been years since I pet her, but the muscle memory of my hands groom her fur like no time has passed. The light glints off her bright green eyes and she mews at me. As I'm patting her, wisps of fur come off in my hands. It's slight at first, but then increases to heavy lumps. I stop petting her, but it continues to shed from her skin. Her meows distort and one of her eyes starts to drift. What the fuck is this? Her freshly bare skin softens rapidly in my arms. A smell hits my nose that instantly waters my mouth with nausea. She decays until there's nothing left but a mummified feline corpse in my arms. The carpet around my feet turns to fur, its firmness melting to a spongy softness. The animals around me on the floor are decaying rapidly and I realize that the carpet, which is now fur, is a mass of gore death and decay. The floor pulses like it's breathing and again I leave as fast as my feet will let me, desperately trying not to sink into the muck. I now dreadfully realize exactly what I'm dealing with. It's a never-ending hallway of doors. They all lead to different scenarios, each more horrifying than the last. I fall to my knees in utter despair. Seizing the moment while I'm in control, I stand. The periphery of my vision swims, but my knees hold firm. My fear begins to evolve. The frozen grip, my heart melts away with the fire of rage. This is all lies. I'm not even awake. You can't really hurt me. You can't hurt my family. They're already gone. My voice quakes with an unrecognizable intensity. It takes me by surprise. After a series of gurgly breaths, the mass speaks. Oh no, darling. A gray tongue slicks out over the lips of the main open maw. They ain't gone, not from here. A lumpy appendage motions towards my temple. People live on through the memory, and that's why I'm here. I've come to take the one thing that you think truly belongs to you. My eyes narrow. I'm trying not to show that I'm slowly losing my nerve. Well, while that's terrible, it's likely to happen when I get older anyway. You can't scare me with what I won't remember. My voice still confident, but not as loud this time. The eyes stop their activity and leer at me in unison. It starts to glide toward me. Wrong again. You will always remember. Everything that you see here will be the only thing you ever remember. Your brain is like wet cement that I get to imprint on in any way I'd like right now. 
Once the cement dries, the blueprints are frozen forever. The thing's face morphed into various faces of people that I loved and admired through life with each sentence that it spoke. Their tones, all hateful, their cold and glaring eyes bore through me, causing me to feel a great pain that I can't quite localize. All breath is robbed forcefully from my lungs as if suffering a heavy blow from my back. The pain of trying to breathe is excruciating, but the panic of my suffering lungs hurts even worse. My joints twist and contort with sickening cracks. If I could breathe, I would be screaming right now. Boiling tears escape my eyes. Searing burns slide with them as they cascade down my face. The thing bellows voraciously with laughter. You're hurting now, ain't you, little girl? Isn't that something? I'll twist it up like a pretzel with a barbecued face. I notice the closer it gets to me, the larger it becomes. Before long, the creature is looming over me. Out of all the ways you fucked up, do you want to know what your biggest mistake was? All along, you thought you were desensitized to fear. You just allowed your mind to become complacent. Honestly, it was never that you were numb to fear. You just made the dangerous mistake of thinking that you were safe. I woke up from my hell about four days ago. Since then, I haven't been able to leave the house. Eric calls, but I have no need to talk to him. Not after all that I've seen. This was a mistake. I would give anything to go back to the way it was. You see, now I'm terribly fearful of everything. Nothing will ever seem safe. The creature's eyes are in every one that I see, and its final words echo infinitely in my head like a second train of thought. You just made the dangerous mistake of thinking, and you were safe. Be careful while attempting lucid dreaming. You never know if you truly come back from it.